All right. Hi, folks, and welcome to our last day of Jumpstart. It's been um, really an amazing week. I've been super thrilled to hear from everybody, and I've enjoyed our, our early morning half hour sessions um, and also the guest speakers who have just been phenomenal. And then of, even interestingly, the debriefs, I've just really enjoyed talking with these groups from across USNH. So today we invited um, Pat Cantor, who most of you know, but some of you won't know. Um, she's the Associate Provost here at Plymouth State. Um, and obviously she's been working so centrally with the team um, that has been navigating COVID um, and also all of the changes that are um, coming to our institutions. So I just said, Pat, can you come and give us a lay of the land and maybe a pep talk <laughs> because we might need one. Um, and I think if you know Pat, you know she's known for being um, just super, super thoughtful and a super supportive person. So I'm glad you're here, Pat. And uh, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm going to put up, um, actually now I lost it because why not? Um, Hold on, I will do it. I'm gonna put up a screen of a slide that Pat's not actually going to use, but it's gonna allow me to do the live captioning. Um, so you can go ahead and start, Pat, and I'll get that going in a second. Okay, thanks a lot, Robin. Um, I'm really excited that you invited to me to be here today. And when Robin invited me, she said three things, update faculty about what to expect in the spring give a pep talk and answer questions. Update faculty about what will happen in the spring is, <laughs> is basically more of the same and probably some things we don't expect. So I don't know how much I can give you in terms of an update, except we'll, we plan to start the same way that we started this semester. We've learned some things about what works and what doesn't work in terms of teaching and learning. Um, I find myself back in the same place now that I was at the beginning of the fall semester of trying to figure out what classes will fit in what rooms with physical distancing and things like that. So, I mean, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball as Ann says about what to what exactly to expect for the spring. I think when we started out, we hoped that the spring might look like previous springs. We know that it will look more like the last fall, but as Martha said, <laughs> a vaccine is on the way and we may end the spring looking more like previous springs. So that is my non-forecast forecast. Since I don't have a lot of solid things to talk about with regard to what to expect, I, I thought I'd take advantage of this time because I know there are some great teachers on this uh, session to talk a little bit about my own experience teaching this fall, both in terms of uh, I feel your pain and I feel your rewards kind of thing. And just to share some of the surprises and insights that I gained from my teaching experience and what I'm thinking about for my own teaching in the spring. So as I face the uncertainty of the spring too. And then I, I will have plenty of time to talk with you about any questions you have. Um, I, you know, I've been a teacher for 30 years of preschoolers and college students. So this year was unusual for me in that my whole job wasn't about teaching. Um, and I've been a chair in the past, so I'm familiar with administration, but this year um, teaching was a different experience for me. I only had one class. And, uh, you know, as I prepared for the fall, I was thinking a lot about the rule of twos that Robin shared last spring, which was really helpful for me when we switched to remote and I was teaching um, a full load of classes. And in addition to the rule of twos about thinking about two really important big ideas to share, uh, to focus on this semester, and what are the two tech tools that I'll primarily use. And I, I also thought I'm going to think about what are two strengths that I know I'm bringing into this semester that I can rely on and bank on. 
and what are two challenges that I know I can anticipate and try to plan for? So, I mean, strengths, I thought, okay, I've got content knowledge for this class. I was teaching a class on language and literacy development for first through age eight. It's a, con it's a class with lots and lots of content and really important content in my field of uh, preparing early childhood educators. I mean, there is there are a few things more important that early childhood teachers do than help children learn language and help them, help them become literate. So there's a lot riding on this particular course, but I, I knew the content well. And, and I thought, okay, and I have pedagogical knowledge. I can bank on that. And I had a real advantage that I'm fully aware not everybody has going into any particular course that I knew all these students. I had had them in class before. I'd already invested a lot of time in community building. And I had such an advantage that that community was there. They all knew each other. They all knew me trust was established and all that time I had spent in previous classes on community building was going to be my friend. So strengths I knew I had that I could count on. Two challenges that I knew I'd be facing are um, challenges in terms of the experiential component that um, in my field I count on so much for my classes. I was working with people who are going to be teachers. I count on them having experiences with children that they can talk about and bring to my class and we can draw on. Those experiences didn't happen this fall. I couldn't, I had to change, for example, all my assignments, so many of which involved read a book to a child and reflect on their responses listen to a group of preschoolers talking, analyze how they use language, look at some of their syntax, their vocabulary, etc. I couldn't rely on any of those because my students could not actually be in classrooms. They couldn't observe a kindergarten teacher, teach a literacy lesson. They couldn't do any of the things I counted on. So I knew I'd have to change all my assessments and I'd have to change a lot of the ways that I planned in class to have students connect with uh, their experiences. And then the other kind of experiential piece I knew I'd be challenged by was thinking about all the group work we do in class and how to make that work. That for me felt like a real challenge because um, my classes typically involve a lot of small group discussion, a lot of small group work, and I had to figure out ways to make that happen in a classroom where people are physically distanced from each other and some people are on a screen, uh, screen. I was teaching a hybrid class with always three students attending remotely and usually a fourth or fifth attending remotely for that particular day. So those were the challenges I kind of thought about as I was going in and tried to plan around. And then I got in the classroom and I discovered new challenges. So the rule of two multiplied quite a bit with challenges. And I don't know if some of you experienced this too, but one of the first challenges I encountered in the classroom was realizing I couldn't move. Like when you're in the classroom and you're in this, in these designated areas because of physical distancing, you really need to stay in your space. You don't want to get in people's, within people's three to six foot zone. I just felt so tethered to the front of the classroom that, and I didn't realize that I would feel that way until I was in that position and, and in my tiny space. So that just helped me realize, I see Rochelle saying oh, that was hard. I, I mean, that, I was surprised by how hard that was. I, I realized how much I had relied on movement as part of interaction and how I needed to move while I taught. And, I had to learn new ways of dealing with that feeling of being tethered. Another piece I realized very quickly, and I can't believe I didn't realize this ahead of time, is how dependent I have been on nonverbal feedback from students and facial expressions and how much feedback I give students through my facial expressions and nonverbal feedback. I mean, I think I was in the classroom like, 
probably my third class or something when I realized, oh, they can't see me smiling. You know, it felt like a two-year-old when they put their hands over their face and they think you can't see them. I didn't realize because I was smiling under my mask that they couldn't see me under my mask, that they couldn't see me smiling. So I had to figure out ways to give a lot more, um, to give feedback in different ways in my tethered spot um, so that they would know I was listening and responding. Um, something that happened to me that was kind of an accidental benefit in my class and that taught me a good lesson is I had a smallish class, uh, small 12 students. And again, three were remote. The first two classes that I taught, I, I mean, I taught at five o'clock, I would have a very busy day. I'd run into the classroom at five and I didn't really have a lot of time to pr prepare the room. Uh, I realized I didn't know how to get the camera to be on me. So the students on Zoom could see the other students in the classroom, but they couldn't see me in my tethered spot. So, you know, I thought, oh, this is not going to work. I'm going to be this disembodied voice to the students on Zoom. But, you know, I figured, okay, I'll figure this out. I'll, I'll ask for help. We did this a couple of times, two classes. I finally had time to ask for help. But the third class, I came in and said, okay, now I'm going to fix the camera so you can see me. And, and they said, don't. <laughs> He said, we don't want to see you. We really want to see each other. Keep the camera the way it is. We really enjoy looking at each other while you're talking. If we need to see you, you know, we'll tell you. And we kind of continue that way. I think occasionally I'd appear on camera as a hand or a, a little bit of a face or the top of my head. All my students on Zoom stayed on camera the whole time. I think part of it is because they saw each other. Now, again, in my circumstances, these students knew each other, they had relationships, and obviously that played an enormous role. But this idea that they wanted to see each other and react to each other and talk to each other turned out to be this tremendous benefit of my own ignorance in how to shape the camera. So that was something interesting for me this semester and something I need to, I wanna really think about moving into the spring if I wanna keep that kind of set up. Um, something that I learned about my own teaching too is, uh, you know, I've been teaching a long time, as I said, and I know when I started out teaching I scripted a lot. I was nervous. I felt I had to cover so much content. I was anxious about not getting everything I needed to. So I wrote a, I wrote down everything I wanted to say, everything, you know, and I, I planned out kind of to the minute. I, over time, I'm happy to say, let so much of that go. Also, obviously becoming more familiar with my content and more experience with teaching, I was able to let a lot of that go. And I'm very comfortable going into a class and throwing the plan out the window and having a great class. I mean, some of my best classes have been on those days when the plan just didn't work and it was time to throw, you know, uh, ad lib or going in with, you know, three ideas written on a piece of paper and saying, this is what I'm gonna focus on today and having an interactive discussion that really gets to what we want to talk about. I found when I was teaching this semester, I started going back to scripting. And I think it was because I was nervous about the new setup. I wasn't sure what to expect. I was focused a lot on making the technology work and making sure the Zoom students were included. Uh, and I started getting in that scripted place again. And I had to pull myself away from that because I felt that it was really interfering with students learning because I was getting so focused on making sure everything had to go just so. And one of the days that helped me with that was one of the days when, um, one of the many days, when uh, I think it was Zoom broke. I don't know if it was Zoom or Moodle, one of them. And so we couldn't bring the students, the remote students in. I felt 
pretty flustered by that. So I just turned to the students and said, what are your ideas about how we can fix this? And they immediately jumped to, we're going to FaceTime, we're going to do this. Everybody took a responsibility for someone else. And we, within two minutes, we were able to carry on the class through FaceTime and everything else. And I thought, okay, I need to learn to ask my students for help, to trust them, to not be so scripted and to um, relax a little bit. So that really helped me with <laughs> at the beginning of the semester. Um, what I'm thinking about as I go into the spring is, uh, and this is where I've also benefited from being able to observe in other classes this semester, which has been a wonderful aspect of this job. I've been in several classes as an observer. I've also been in as a guest speaker and that was great. Uh, so I've learned a lot from what colleagues are doing. And uh, I've also learned from what I hear from students um, about kind of some of the challenges of their experience this semester and some of the things that have worked really well. Not just my students, but students at the university in general. I'm thinking a lot about simplicity, not necessarily simplicity of content, but simplicity of the mechanics of my class and how I can really pare that down, pare down um, the way I interact with the students, the kinds of technology we use, the expectations for their ways of uh, interacting with the class and simplicity and clarity in the sense of how I set up my learning management system, how I uh, kind of frame big ideas in the class. I, I think students really valued classes that were presented clearly so that they could engage with the ideas without having to find their way in, in convoluted ways. Um, and where the mechanics of the class were clear and fairly simple. Um, flexibility is the other lesson I'm thinking of, about a lot. Fortunately, my background's in early childhood and that is what we do all the time because children are completely unpredictable, uh, especially when they're little and you can't go in with expecting them to do everything the way you expect. Uh, so I'm, I'm really thinking a lot about how to be even more flexible. I did find this semester that I pared down and pared down and that was a helpful process to really think about what is the most important stuff for them to know and how will I know that they know it? How will I give them opportunities to show what they know? And that pare down process has been really helpful. So I'm thinking about that for the spring. And the other thing I'm thinking about is just to keep reminding myself of that I can do this and what are my strengths and try to build on those and focus on those. And I think this is where the pep talk piece comes in because in my uh, experiences being in other classrooms and talking with uh, faculty and talking with students about their experiences, I've heard so many amazing things about the faculty here and what they're doing in their classrooms and how they're supporting students. I've seen so much compassion for the students' experience. I've seen that in um, the record amounts of care forms we've had this year where faculty are really trying to reach out early for students who are struggling. I've seen that in faculty who contacted our office to say they're concerned about students and want our help in reaching out to students. I've seen that in uh, faculty who are coming up with really creative, interesting ways to engage students in learning. I mean, I've been so lucky to see so much of that this semester, um, which is great. So, and I know that being amazing is exhausting. <laughs> um, and I just had one class with, you know, 13 students this semester. Um, so I know how hard it is to really do this work. And that's where I'm gonna express appreciation and awe at everything that you've all done. We've all made mistakes this semester. We're all gonna make mistakes next semester, but we're also doing some pretty, pretty good work. And hard to do that in an unpredictable, uh, scary environment the way we're in. Um, 
but our students are really appreciating what we do. That's what I had to say. I, I haven't, I can't read chat and talk. Um, you're, you're great and you can open it if you want, but um, we do have about five minutes. Um, and I know not everybody's from Plymouth State, but I'm sure Pat would welcome questions or conversation from, from anybody. Um, does anybody want to throw anything in, either stuff that made you think about or questions you might have? Now is a good chance. Um, I can't really see you all, so just go ahead and unmute and ask if you have anything. Well, I, this is Marianne. I like, Pat, that you again remind us about <clears throat> uh, seeking input from students about uh, what worked well and what were the challenges. And this is going to be particularly important to me because I was on sabbatical this fall. So I'm a little bit more out of the loop than everyone. And I think by asking students for their input and hopefully receiving some response, um, that will also help build trust and signal that I'm uh, committed to the students as part of this enterprise. So that was a good reminder. I think coming back from sabbatical must be a little bit like some of those stories I'm hearing of people who've been away on a desert island and they just come back and see COVID and it's like, you know, <laughs> they were out sailing for a year or whatever. So walking back into the university now when, when uh, teaching just really has such a different substance to it um, these days, I think even it's been really interesting to me to hear people who have t gone from teaching fully online before COVID to fully online after COVID, because you'd think it'd be the same course it always was. Um, and they're remarking on how much the COVID landscape has transformed their students' expectations, their students' needs, and how their curriculum is functioning. Uh, we have time for another. Anybody else have anything they want to toss in or ask? Um, I do. This is Rochelle, if you can't see me. Um, Pat, I really appreciated how you mentioned this idea of being tethered to this spot and all of this sort of signaling and engagement that happens in that physical environment. Because I found that super, super challenging. And it's not who I am in the classroom. I think like part of the energy that happens in the classroom is from me just moving around and like tripping over the computer cord and like all kinds of human awkwardness. Um, but I wonder if anyone has any insights about how they were able to, in a setting when you're teaching in the classroom with a mask on and students on Zoom, how did we get some of that signaling? Like what are the things to, to look for, to pay attention to? That's very much a question that I have no answers to, but I really struggled with how to read the students in the, the ways that I would normally read them. Someone's going to jump in, so we'll give it a second. Anybody have any ideas on this? I was, this is Bridget. Um, I just wanted to jump in and say, uh, especially if you're in the classroom setting, I think that's a, I agree, it's an extremely large hurdle to overcome but I early on in the fall actually did a couple meetings where we were all on Zoom because I, I, I wanted people to see my whole face and like my facial expressions and to, you know, when, again, that when they were comfortable to turn on their cameras so that I could see some of them and I communicated that. And it, I mean, and I know it was only for like a split second at that point when we had done that, but I, I personally felt like that was a piece that was sorely missing in my face-to-face -face sessions at the beginning with my mask on and me saying like, nope, you, you have to stay there. I can't come over there. And, and that whole weirdness, which like kind of broke my heart too. It was just sort of like, don't come by me. You don't, I won't go by you. It was a very much like a get away from me thing, which is so not the way that I am in my classroom. And, and I, I don't know, it felt, it felt like a small thing, but potentially an impactful thing to have, um, 
to have a, a Zoom meeting with with everyone and also like, okay, we no one's wearing a mask. So it's nice to like see everybody not wearing a mask because it seems really strange to um, only ever see people wearing masks in that face-to-face -face setting in our sort of new um, environment. I think it's really interesting how in some ways, you know, face-to-face -face during COVID is very alienating. And I think, um, there's definitely been some people who have taken a second look at the online affordances after experiencing how alienating some parts of the face-to-face -face classroom are when you are distanced in these ways. Um, there's much more we could say about all of this, um, but I am going to get us ready for the next session. So I'm gonna stop recording.